you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, grab them and go with me to Mark chapter number 14, the book of Mark in chapter number 14. And Pastor Chapel told me on, I think, Friday or Saturday that he was going to be in town. I told him I would gladly take a seat on the bench and let him preach this morning. This is his sermon I'm about to preach anyway. No, I'm just teasing. It's not. Mark chapter number 14, though. And I know you're glad to have your pastor back. And if you're visiting Lancaster Baptist Church, come back next week. I guarantee you'll hear a much better sermon than you're going to hear this morning. But the Lord will help us here this morning with this text. Mark chapter number 14. If you found your place and if you're willing and able, would you stand with me out of respect for the reading of the word of God? Mark chapter number 14. And look with me at verse number three, Mark chapter 13, 14, verse number three. The Bible reads, and beginning in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, so the he there is Jesus, he is on his way to the cross. A few days from here, he'll be crucified, he'll be betrayed and then crucified. So Jesus is sitting at me and there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious, and she break the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, why was this waste of ointment made? For it, had been, for it, had, it might have been sold for more than 300 pence. And have been given to the poor, and they murmured against her. And Jesus said, let her alone. Why trouble ye her? For she hath wrought a good work on me. For ye have the poor with you always. And whensoever ye will, ye may do them good. But me ye have not always. She hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. So verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. And Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray, to betray him. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you would use your word in our lives. Father, and I pray that while I speak to the congregation, Father, your spirit might speak to the individual. That while my words address the mind, I pray that your word would address the heart. And I pray that you would lead us into who you want us to be. And may we willingly and gladly follow. And we ask all these things according to the name of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And by his name we pray. And all the church said together, amen. amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. In your Bible, over this section, it may be appropriately titled, Mary Anoints Jesus. And while that is certainly what happens in the text, if you will notice the anointing, really only takes place in one verse. It happens in verse number three. All the other verses in the text are Jesus' interactions with the disciples, namely Judas. And I'm not saying that we ought to change the title of the section and we ought to take the limelight off Mary and put the limelight on to Judas, but what I am saying is that we are clearly meant to read this passage as a comparison. It's a contrast between the way in which Mary selflessly devoted herself to the cause and the person of Christ and the way that Judas selfishly lived for himself. It's really the main idea. If you don't get anything else this morning, I hope you get this. That a life spent in selfless devotion to Jesus is not a wasted life. A life spent on self is totally wasted. A life spent in selfless devotion for Jesus is not wasted. But a life spent on self it's totally wasted. 
Mary and Judas both, they, they cast a long shadow into church history. Jesus says that wherever, verse 9, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. That even today we're reading about the story of Mary, that what she did was recognized by Christ and was acknowledged by him. But also what she did stands as a testament to the way in which many of us should choose to use and spend our lives. This is a good thing to remember someone like Mary. How many of you know someone by the name of Mary? Let me see. You know someone by the name of Mary? How many of you named Mary perhaps, right? How many of you know someone by the name of Judas? Well, I hope not, right? <laughs> and Mary, Mary's shadow casts long into the future as a good testament to what she has done. And Judas, he ruined that name a long time ago. And yet here they sit before us in this text. And I wonder how many of us would be, if we were honest, how we would be more like Judas thinking of what we can get in the moment, the opportunity that is before us, using Jesus, using the cause of Christ just for our own good or our own gain. Or how many of us are like Mary, who have a selfless devotion to the cause of Christ and to the person of Christ? We'll, we'll contrast them just a little bit this morning, but, but notice that in order to spend our lives in devotion to Jesus, there's several things we learn about Mary. There, there are several things we can learn from Mary, rather. Notice first that she thanked Christ for her past. The Bible reads in verse number three, and being in Bethany. You say, well, well, David, what did she thank Christ for her past for? Well, John gives us more insight to this event than Mark does. And in John, this story is recorded for us in chapter number 12. Now, the reason that's important is because chapter 12 follows chapter 11. That's how it goes. 12 follows 11. And in John chapter 11, there's a story about a man by the name of Lazarus. Lazarus is Mary's brother, also the brother of Martha. But the Bible says that Lazarus grew sick and died. Do you remember that story? And in John chapter number 11, Jesus hears tell of his friend Lazarus. He makes his way over to Bethany. He sees the heartbreak. He's moved with compassion. He cries tears. Jesus feels what you feel. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are. Yet Jesus was without sin. Jesus knows what it's like to have a broken heart. Jesus knows what it's like to see trouble. Jesus knows knows what it's like to suffer. Jesus understands what it's like to be in difficult situations like you may find yourself in this morning. And Jesus hears of his friend named Lazarus and he comes and the Bible says in chapter number 11 that Jesus looks at the tomb of Lazarus and he says, Lazarus, come forth. He resurrects Lazarus from the dead. And in chapter number 12, the story begins the same way Mark's begins. And then they went to the house. And Mary in this moment realizes what Jesus has done for her family. But don't miss the picture. Don't miss the picture for you and for me. And that is that Lazarus is a representation of who we are in our sins. That we are dead in our trespasses and sin, the Bible says. It's last summer I turned 40 years old. And it was brutal, I have to tell you. Family and friends and staff. I mean, I was getting tombstones. It was nothing but black in the room. You would have thought it was the end. And I'm telling people, it's not that bad. It's just 40 for crying out loud. But you would have thought the way they treated me was like I had one foot in the grave already. And the reality is that because of our sin, we do have one foot in the grave. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, the Bible says. The cost of sin, the payment of sin is death. And who here among us is without sin? No, the Bible is very clear. We have all sinned. 
So regardless of what your, your age is, you do have one foot in the grave. It doesn't matter if you're 14 or 40. It doesn't matter if you're 65 or 85. One day, all of us, because of our sin, will come to an end by way of death in this life. And our only hope, according to the Bible, is that God would give us life, which he did. And he did this through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul says it in Ephesians chapter 2 that even though we were dead in our trespasses and sin, yet we hath he quickened, which literally means we hath he made alive. He made us alive together with Christ. By grace are ye saved through faith. If you're here this morning and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, then our prayer for you this morning is that today you would recognize who Christ is, how much Christ has loved you, the direction in which you are headed from Christ, and the way in which Christ has pursued you through his cross, and that you would turn from your sin, and you would turn from your self-righteousness, and you would believe wholly on the Lord Jesus Christ, who like for life. Lazarus does not simply offer us resurrection. He is the resurrection and the life. There's a big difference. Jesus doesn't simply claim to have resurrection and life. Jesus doesn't simply say he understands the secrets of resurrection or of eternal life. No, no, no. Jesus claimed, I am the resurrection and the life. You see, to know Jesus is to know life. To know Jesus is to know the resurrection. Eternal life is promised to us through Christ. And she's thanking him because Jesus makes dead, makes dead, make, make, made the dead to live. But this dinner, notice, is not just at Bethany. It's someplace in particular. Being in Bethany, the notice this, in the house of Simon the leper. So Mary is not only overwhelmed for what Christ has done for Lazarus, but Mary is overwhelmed because this is taking place in the house of a man by the name of Simon. Simon, Mark says, the leper might be uh, better, better put, Simon, the former leper. The lepers had uh, no course of contact with, with anyone in normal life. They were, they were socially outcast. Imagine someone saying to you, hey, do you, you want to go to my friend's house for a barbecue? You say, well, sure. Wh who is it? Well, it's, it's Simon. And he's a great guy. He's a very highly contagious person. <laughs> he has an untreatable skin condition named leprosy. Please come on over. It seems likely that Jesus here would have cleansed Simon of his leprosy. She's thanking him because he made the unclean clean. You see, through Christ, our uncleanness is taken away. We are unclean, and yet Christ has taken away our sin forever. And Jesus not only went to the cross to die for our sin, Jesus went to the cross to remove the stain of sin from us. And this is what Paul tells the church at Rome. He says in chapter 8, there is now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus our Lord. We're free from sin in this way. We're free to walk in newness of life. We're free to be who God has made us to be. If you want to grow in your devotion toward Christ, you must thank him for what he has done in your life. This is what Mary is doing. If you want to grow in your devotion for Christ, not only do we see from Mary that she thanked him for her past, but we also notice that she trusted Christ with her future. This is really picking up in the second half of verse three. As he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious. She break the box and poured it on his head. So as the men talk, as Martha serves, Mary takes this alabaster box filled with perfume. Now, listen, this isn't this isn't a six pack of Old Spice, okay? That's not what this is. 
The very expensive perfume. You say, well, well, how expensive? In other passages of the Bible, we see that Judas estimates the worth at 300 denarii, which is about a year's worth of salary in that day. Now stop and think about that for a second. We can, we, we can let the words of that just pass right over us. A year's worth of salary. How much do you make in a year? Don't answer it out loud. Now, the, average, the average worker in Long Beach makes $31,000 a year, according to the last census. So if, so if this is taking place in Long Beach, she has about $31,000 worth of ointment in today's economy. It was probably her most prized possession. And the Bible says that she laid it all out before him. I, I, I love this. I, I, I love how she does this. Notice there came a, a woman having an alabaster box of ointment, a spike nerve, very precious, and she broke the box and poured it on him. Why do you think she broke the box? Can I give you a couple of thoughts maybe why? Because she's not stingy. There's, there's no going back now. There's no withholding any for herself. If, if this were you and I, we would be tempted to, to measure it out. Okay, here's a little bit for you and here's a lot a bit for me. Now you don't need the whole thing, only a dab will do you. That's all you need. But for her, she breaks the bottle. She says, I'm going to give it all to you. I'm holding nothing back. There's no reservations from her. And as you walk with Christ in your life, there will be moments, large and small, that will come. And you and I will be tempted in those moments to hold back a little bit for us. And think a little bit of ourselves rather than saying, man, this is for Christ. Only one life. It will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. So pour it out. Take it all. It's all for you anyway. There's no going back. But also this, there's no looking around. I love that she doesn't look to the disciples for approval she doesn't look either before she does it, and she doesn't look after she does it. She doesn't ask the disciples if it's okay. And once it's done, she doesn't ask the disciples if they liked what she did. She simply poured it out. This is between her and her Savior. And she, she wanted to do it not that others might see it. She, she wanted to do it not though she could get praise in it. She didn't do it so that others would be impressed by her. She did it because she trusted him. She trusted Christ with her future. She thanked Christ for her past. But notice this. She, she worshiped Christ for his person. Notice verse four. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, why was this waste of ointment made? For, for it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. The disciples saw, specifically Judas, what, what Mary was doing. And he immediately thought, well, that's not smart. This isn't, this isn't modest. There's nothing strategic about this. There's nothing compassionate on this. Jesus saw the same thing that Judas saw, and Jesus thought, this woman will never be forgotten. I don't have to point it out. It's been pointed out plenty already, but Jesus Christ is a person who divides. He divides everything. He divides the calendar of history, everything before him, B.C., everything after him, A.D. He divides humanity, 
All people are either for him or against him. He divides destiny. If you know him, then you are on your way to eternal life. And if you have rejected him, then you are on your way to eternal death. He has come not to bring a peace, but he has come to bring a sword, we are told. And there is no one else like him who, who, inv who invokes such such a far-reaching response. It's love or it's hate. It's devotion or it's rejection. It's worship or it's blasphemy. It's faith or it's unbelief. It's a believer or it's an unbeliever. And he is divided, even here in these final moments, he is dividing those who have followed him most closely. What a waste. That's what they say. Just so you know, this is often how people are. You build a new sports stadium, people will go, wow, that's super, I love it, it's amazing. We needed it. You build a worship center, people go, what a waste. You trick out your living room with all kinds of state-of-the-art technology, people go, wow, how fun. Try to buy a projector for the church, couldn't we get a cheaper one? <laughs> Why was it not a waste? Why was it not a waste? Well, waste is determined by who the gift is for. Amen. It's not a waste because it's for Jesus. One of the most expensive restaurants in the world is a restaurant in Spain. It charges $2,000 per seat for a 20-course meal. If you heard that for a love offering for me and my family, Pastor Chapel decided to fly us to Spain. Let me eat in this very expensive restaurant, and not just me, but my whole family, which is ever growing. Just so you know, there's eight of us now. And we're paying it, we're paying for everybody, even the baby. If, if you heard that happen, you'd go, How ridiculous! What a waste! And imagine I responded to you, Hey, hey, chill out. I'm worth it. <laughs> You'd say, get out of here. And you would be right. Hey, notice what Jesus says. Let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. You know what he says? No, 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 you got it wrong. It's not a waste. It's worship. Amen. And I'm worth it. Amen. You see? I'm worth it. And Jesus says what she's doing makes a lot of sense to me. The, the, the problem wasn't that there was no concern for the poor. The, the, the problem is that their valuation of the poor is relative as it compares to Jesus. That, that if they had known in the moment, the moment that they were in, if they had recognized the person that was in front of them, they would not have thought it to be a waste. They would not have elevated the needs of the poor to Christ himself. You see what the story is saying? The story is saying there is something unique about Jesus. Do you see how unique Jesus is? Do you recognize the worth he has? And are you responding in proper devotion to him? Does your devotion to Jesus, does it make sense to non-Christians? There's a version of Christianity which is acceptable to even the world. Does your devotion to Jesus make sense to non-Christians? It shouldn't. See, being a part of a community, that makes sense. 
Being a part of a church, that even may make sense. It, it may even be considered a good thing. Giving your kids morals makes sense. But radical devotion, extravagant adoration, wholehearted worship, worship of Jesus that is not just mundane or routine, but that is whole body, soul, spirit, strength, all in direction of Christ. That does not make sense to the world. And she worshipped Christ for his person. She trusted Christ with her future. She thanked Christ for her past. Look at this one, this fourth one though. Verse 6, verse 7, verse 8. She served Christ as best she could. Notice what he says. Verse 7, for ye have the poor with you always and whensoever ye may do them good. But me you have not always. She hath done what she could. Her action was simply a response to the question, what can I do for Jesus? Well, she's not one of the 12. She's not a prophet. She's not a religious leader. So she couldn't do any of those things. But she did what she could. Do you see how freeing this is? Because you don't have to be anyone except who God made you to be. Amen. You don't have to do what anyone else does except what God has called you to do. You, you simply have to do what the Lord has called, has gifted, has wired, has placed you here to do. That's all you have to do. And so many times we live in the world of the only ifs, only if I had those gifts, only if I lived in that place, only if I had that house, only if I raised those kids, only if I had that money. We live our lives as if only if were it. No, 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 no. A life of devotion is not built on only if. A life of devotion is built on the reality of who we are, of who God has made us to be, of where God has placed us. You say, well, well, Dave, of course Jesus would recognize this woman. She's spending a full year's salary on devotion and worship to him. I'll just quickly point out to you that Jesus has already in Mark chapter 13 highlighted a woman who gave two nickels. He pointed her out as the gold medal giver in all of the Bible. He's sitting with the disciples and he says, you see, this woman, she is given more than they all. It's not about the amount. It's about understanding who God has made you to be. Recognizing the gifts that God has already given to you and then utilizing them with all you have in honor and glory for him. A sensitivity to who and what the Lord has given you allows you to participate in moments that other people simply miss. Mary is living with a spiritual self-awareness. She knows who she is. She knows who Christ is. And she is using all she has in full adoration and worship of him. And Jesus tells the disciples, Mary has done a good work. Friend, you don't have to do my work. You don't have to do her work. You don't have to do his work. In order to do a good work, you simply have to do the work that God has given you to do. That's it. If you do the work that God has given you to do with the strengths and the gifts and the abilities that God has given to you, then one day you will hear from your Savior, well done, good and faithful servant. You've done a good work. 
Don't you want to hear that from Christ? You may not have the intellect someone else has. You may not have the resources someone else has. You may not live in the same city that someone else lives in. You may not have the same abilities that other people have. But you don't have to. You have to simply use what God has given to you. Mary is a woman who lives in full devotion to Christ. Why? Because she did what she could. She served Christ as best she could. Let me give you this last one and we'll get out of here on this one. Notice this. She loved Christ for his cross. This is verse 8. She hath done what she could. She is come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. For verily I say unto you that wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. In a couple days from Mark chapter 13, Jesus goes to Jerusalem, he's crucified on the cross. And you will remember this, Jesus is telling his disciples repeatedly, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to die. The Son of Man will be delivered over into the hands of sinful men. Even in the text, verse 1 and verse 2, they're conspiring how they might take and arrest him. And yet, they're fearful because it's still the feast and they don't want to move on a feast day. And even how the text ends, Judas goes down to the chief priest's house and he conspires with them in treachery of how he might hand Jesus over to them. Jesus is telling them time and time again, I am going to be crucified. I am going to die for sinful men. This is the reason I have come. And yet the disciples, they are like us. They are slow learners. They didn't understand what it meant. In their minds, Jesus was just praised. They were throwing palm trees down on the street. They were saying, Hosanna. If anyone was coming to take Jesus, it wasn't coming to crucify him. They were coming to make him king. But Mary, Mary seems to understand. And though she could not have possibly understood all of the ramifications of his death, Mary understood what he was about to do. And Mary loved Jesus, not simply for what he had done. Mary loved Jesus for what he was about to do, to go to the cross and die for sinful men. You say, Dave, what, what exactly did Jesus do? The book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus would go to the cross and he would endure the cross, despising the shame for the joy that would be set before him. You see, Jesus endured the cross so that you and I could enjoy heaven. Jesus laid down his life so that you and I could be given life. Jesus became sin so that you and I could be made righteous through Christ. Jesus became poor so that you and I could be made rich. What did Jesus do? Jesus went to the cross and died for sinful men of which I am chief. Now, without Christ, there's no eternal life. Without Christ, there's no joy. Without Christ, there's no love. Without Christ, there's no peace. Without Christ, there's no hope. But with Christ, there is eternal life. And with Christ, there's a deep, abiding joy. And in Christ, there's life, long purpose. And with Christ, there's peace, a peace that passeth all understanding. All of that is ours in Christ. She had listened to Jesus enough to know that the moment that they were in was a moment that deserved her response of selfless devotion. So Mary asks herself, will I have another opportunity to show him how much I love him? She heads to her room. She gets the alabaster box. She opens it. She pours it out. 
It's His devotion that moved her to devotion. It's His devotion that moved her to devotion. You see, friend, to the depth that you understand how much Christ loved you, what Christ has done for you, and that demands a response on your part and on mine. The songwriter, I think, said it best, did e'er such love and sorrow meet? Or thorns compose so rich a crown? Love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all. You cannot love Jesus too much. You cannot follow Jesus too closely. You cannot worship Jesus too intensely. What if you and I, what if you and I were remembered for nothing else in this life except our selfless, extravagant devotion to Jesus? Jesus.